Hi everyone. Now that we've understood what development means and different ways to measure it, let's look at institutional factors within a country that can lead to development, that are important for development to occur. And in an essay, these are the three big ones that we must always come back to when we talk about development outcomes being achieved. We look at education, healthcare and infrastructure as major ways of getting development, of major ways of getting a developing country to progress. Education. So when we talk about education, it's important not just to stop there. We can't just say, look, you know, this factor, whatever will happen, will lead to more education, which will lead to more development. No, 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 that's poor analysis. That's not going to score many marks. So we need to know that education is important. We need to look at ways of measuring it, like adult literacy, like enrollment rates in education, etc. But we need to look specifically at what the benefits of education are in promoting development. And here they are in green for development. Education leads to high productivity levels, which we know is a major constraint on development. So that's a great thing. The more education there is and the more educated people there are, um, the greater potential for these people to gain good jobs, to earn higher incomes, to gain a good standard of living, to be able to buy material things that makes their family better off. But also, it promotes choice, which is very important. Social and economic choice. Both of which have been mentioned by Sen and Tadaro as fundamental in the pursuit of development. If women are educated, and this is interesting, if women end up being educated, it can promote more gender equality, yes, but also by empowering women in society, you have a greater chance of achieving development outcomes quickly. Why? Because if women are educated and they, and they go and earn money, they go and find jobs, they are more responsible and more willing to spend money on promoting schooling of their children, of promoting health in their family, of making sure that sanitation facilities, cooking facilities, gas, electricity, tele telecommunications, all these kind of things in their family are taken care of. So if you empower women, you have a greater chance of, them, of achieving development and promoting development. So if we educate women, there is a great chance of achieving de development outcomes in the future. If you educate well, then you can also have some health benefits. You educate people as to the problems of, of, uh, of, uh, of HIV, the problems of, of malaria and how to avoid catching such disease. You educate people about how important sanitation is, how important sewage is, etc. And this is a great way of restricting disease and of making sure that people take vaccinations and, and know of how to uh, stay away from such major diseases. You can also promote the idea of, of uh, how contraception can be used to uh, prevent against unwanted pregnancy, which can, can, which can control the birth rate, high birth rates in these countries. It can also promote the advancement of, of technology. People have skills and know how to actually pursue the advancement of technology. But barriers to education and barriers to development of education can be funding. Funding is a big, big problem, very expensive thing, very hard to make inclusive. So funding is a major issue here. And if, the government can't afford to provide it in its entirety and we allow some private sector involvement here, well then is it right to exclude people based on price? Is it right to charge a price for education? Is that just going to promote greater income inequality? At the same time, you may be dealing with or fighting with underlying problems in the economy or underlying thought processes in the economy, which might be that, you know, as soon as children hit a certain age, they're seen as workers instead of children. So when they, hit to, when they hit ages such as 9, 10, 11, a lot of parents will see that age as a time where these kids can actually work on farms and earn incomes for the whole family. So in that sense, we might see a lot of enrolment in primary education, but we may not see much enrolment in secondary education, which can be a limit on the benefits of education and then development. So that's another problem you can be dealing with, cultures and, and uh, where children may be needed to be used in, in the economy. With healthcare, what are the benefits of a good healthcare system or healthcare institutions being more developed? Well, again, the healthier people are, the more productive they're going to be. The more jobs potentially can be created in the economy too. If you have lots of hospitals, GP surgeries, lots of places to go, you know, dentist, uh, dentist places, etc., then that's going to promote more jobs in the economy. You can imagine if people are, are healthier, they're going to be happier. It's going to promote a better standard of living. And as well, it's going to imply if there is good health care in the economy, if there is a good standard of health in the economy, it's going to imply that drinking water 
must be available, it's going to imply that sanitation must be strong, that sewage is being looked after and regulated well, etc. These are all good things that constitute towards economic development. But again, funding is another major issue here. Who is going to fund this? If governments don't have the finance to fund it, how are we going to ensure that there are healthcare facilities available to all? And if we argue that, again, the private sector maybe should get involved in here to, to negate the problem of funding, then is it right to exclude people from healthcare based on price? Major arguments and major barriers to development here. And finally, another key pillar of development is infrastructure. Think of infrastructure as all the major things that an economy needs to produce all the major things that must be in place for economic activity to take place. So we think of infrastructure, we think of roads, we think of the building of, of, uh, of schools and hospitals, we think of bridges, we think of ports, we think of airports, we think of telecommunication, we think of sewage, we think of, of toilets and, uh, and sanitation facilities. All these things need to exist for economic activity to take place properly. So what are the benefits of a, an economy having a good infrastructure? Well, it means that access to markets becomes viable. It means firms can transport their goods and services at lower cost. It means consumers can access markets and purchase goods and services at lower prices, which are all very, very important. It means countries can become more competitive. It means that <coughs> children and people who are sick, who are disabled, can access schools and hospitals. Fundamental. It means that foreign countries will look at a developing country and think, oh wow, they have a good infrastructure in place, it's very easy for us to operate our business here, let's invest, which again promotes growth, promotes development in the developing country. But again, major barriers to infrastructure development is funding. These things cost a huge amount of money, building airports, building roads, building bridges. These are all very expensive and although they are necessary and fundamental to development, there's no guarantee that they will actually take place given how expensive they are. Okay, so three pillars, major pillars of development, which we all need to understand the intricate benefits of them and the barriers to them as well. Thanks for watching. See you next time.